Hi, I'm Denise with Romantic Recollections. Today I want to take a deep dive into 18th century passimal tree and fringe trims, or what we commonly call fly fringe today. I love talking about these trims, and I am really excited to share this overview with you. 18th century fringes are a form of knotwork using silk thread to create a fringe composed of many smaller knots, usually with small tufts at the ends that fluff up. Most often these fringes are then incorporated into a woven or knotted braid, sometimes with additional embellishments, and used to create this richly textured trim. Sometimes just small clusters of fringe and embellishments are scattered across an item or made into tassels rather than being woven into a trim. These trims reached the height of popularity on women's gowns in the 1760s and 70s, but they certainly weren't new. Many of the same elements were used on bed hangings and valances and other interior decoration in the 1600s, which means someone somewhere took a look at some old curtains and said, you know, that would look great on a gown, and from there it just turned into a trend. I often get asked about exact dates for this style of trim, and that's a really difficult question. Even museums struggle with exact dates, and many examples just say late 18th century. Most of the gowns that do have a date are usually in the range of like 1760 to 1775, but there's always outliers. There's one stomacher that's dated as 1790, which seems really late to me, not least because stomachers were pretty much out of fashion by then. So either it's misdated or it was made by somebody who really didn't want to give up to the older style of fashions. Another confusing factor is that these trims were used on other items as well. Just a few examples I've seen are a pincushion dated 1725 to 50, a pocket flap from a men's coat dated 1730 to 50, a baby bonnet dated 1740 to 60, and a work bag dated 1780 to 90. There are also references to this style of trim being used on gowns and fichus in the 1730s. So it's entirely possible that these trims were used in small amounts throughout the century, but they gained huge popularity during a very narrow window of time. So let's take a closer look at museum examples of passementerie used on gowns during this period of time. First, let's talk about the colors typically used in these trimmings. Aside from a few exceptions, they usually match the colors of the fabric used for the gown. That means a solid colored gown is likely to have trim in the same shade, while a colorful brocade will also have a colorful trim. In this gown from Kent State, you'll notice that the trim is the exact same shade of yellow as the gown. You'll see the same thing here in this example where an ivory satin is then trimmed with ivory passementerie. However, this gown from the V&A shows a yellow silk gown with yellow and ivory passementerie, and this stands out as a really unique example. There are hundreds of examples pinned on my Pinterest boards from different museum sites, and this is really the only one that stands out as ivory being used when ivory wasn't already a color in the silk. Of course, many of the examples are of the colorful brocade and colorful trim variety. In this example from LACMA, you'll see a gown that is a predominantly white background trimmed with a braid that is also predominantly white. There are blue and pink flowers on the brocade and that is echoed in the blue and pink fringes on the gown. The other thing you may notice is that the colors are used in the similar proportions to what's used on the gown. The pink flowers are very large while the green leaves are smaller and the yellow is a smaller amount. And so the braid uses two pink fringes, one blue fringe, one yellow, and one green to kind of mimic those same proportions. If you look closely, you'll also notice that the fringes are two shades of pink or two shades of blue to echo the detail in the flowers as well. In this example from the Met, you'll see this ivory silk gown that is painted with a floral design, trimmed with ivory silk fringe that then has colorful flowers and embellishments worked into it. So historically, the colors in the trim are going to very closely match the colors in the gown. And I think sometimes people find this really disappointing because Solid colored silks are so much more readily available today, and if you're gonna go through all the time, effort, and expense of making a trim like this, you really want it to have some impact. And pale pink trim on a pale pink gown just doesn't sound like it's gonna have enough oomph to justify all that labor. And maybe that's true. So if historical accuracy is your goal, which it probably is if you're going to go through this much effort, just be aware of how the colors play into that. And if you want a really colorful trim, then you should probably wait until you've also saved up for a really colorful fabric. However, if historical accuracy isn't your thing, I think it would be really amazing to see a solid colored gown with a really striking contrasting trim on it. So now that we've talked about the colors that are used in the trim, let's talk about the actual construction. 
As I mentioned, this is a form of knot work and those knots can be either really simple or really complex. The simplest style of knots are these ones, which I call single knots, although they actually have two tiny knots in the center with a fringe at each end. There aren't very many examples where these are used in the finished trim, but there are a couple of gowns that use extensive amounts of single knots or small clusters of three or four single knots used together. Those single knots can then be knotted into another knot and it creates these little X-shaped fringes that we commonly associate with this style of trim. They can also be used on their own as little X's or at the ends of these other longer fringes to create these little T-shaped crossbars. And you'll notice that this is one of the places where the colors really come into play. You may see a darker pink knotted into a lighter pink to give a little bit of dimension to this fringe. I mentioned that you can take those X-shaped knots and create additional styles of knot work with them. And this gown is a great example. Um, it is a blue and gold brocade and the trim is in blue and yellow silk thread. This gown has both single knots clustered together to create one embellishment as well as longer fringes. And if you look at the longer fringes, they have that X-shaped piece in either blue or yellow, then knotted into the other color to create these sort of five-pointed knots. So they have this five-pointed fringe at each end and they dangle from the trim in the center. Not all of these knotted fringes have those short fluffy tufts to them. For example, these ones have knots at the ends of the fringe. These usually have three pieces like the example here, and the knots are very, very close to the ends, so they don't have room to fluff up. They create a different sort of tassel-like effect in the overall trim. There's another variation on these trims with the knotted ends to create these miniature tassels. The typical three tassels that we saw in the previous example are added to with an additional two tassels and then a little knot at the top. I think they kind of resemble people because it almost looks like a head and arms and a waist with legs coming off of it. But of course, um, there's three legs at the bottom, so that's a little unusual. The silk fringe can also be coiled up and knotted to create these little loops. Those can be used on their own, like they are in this tassel at the V&A, or they can be knotted into a structure with some other knotted fringes, which ends up resembling little rosebuds and leaves. And those are really pretty when they're worked into a final trim. This example comes from an auction website, and in this case, the fringes are tied so that they have two loops and two ends, which makes them kind of look like a little tied bow. And so it looks like a little kite tail or a string of bows all together. So as you can see, um, while we think of those little X-shaped fringes as kind of the marker for this style of trim that we call fly fringe, there's actually a lot of variation in it. There's different construction techniques and different shapes that can be created with that same knotting technique. And all of these can be found in different period examples. The most common style is the ones with the three pointed tufts at the ends. I would say those come up more than anything else, but they can be combined with a five pointed fringe or with those little coiled loops in all sorts of variations. So once you've picked your colors and the style of knots you want to make and you've knotted hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them, um, how do you actually turn this into a finished trim? Let's take a look at the three most common methods. So first up is a chain stitch that resembles single crochet. Now crochet wasn't an 18th century technique and there are other ways to create a chain stitch. If you've ever made a swing tack for a skirt, you're looping the thread in a very similar way and making a chain stitch. So it's likely that in the 18th century they were using a technique more like that or like finger crochet, but today it's much simpler just to do that with a crochet hook. Um, so this example from the V&A is from Barbara Johnson's album, and as you can see it is a sim very simple chain stitch with simple pieces of fringe that have that kind of three pointed fringe on each end. This is probably the simplest and most classic looking type of fringe that could be made to trim a gown. We looked at this example earlier, but if you look at it now, you can also see that this one uses a chain stitch to connect all of those fringes together. Now, of all the examples I've looked at, I've only found three out of hundreds that can clearly show that they were connected with this chain stitch. So it's not incredibly common, but it was done, and it is probably the quickest and the easiest way to create a trim. The next most common style of trim is what I call a puffed trim. And in this case, small puffs of silk are tied with another strand of silk and it creates this very textured central connection. So in this example from the V&A, you can see that there are puffs of ivory silk with a chenille pico along one side. This is a very simple and effective trim, um, but this one doesn't actually have any fringe worked into it. 
This example from the Met has a lot more color. There are strands of olive green silk and maybe a couple others in there tied into puffs with an ivory silk. They really didn't care about matching the color to the thread. And as they went along and made those puffs, they did insert small fringes. So this is a very textured sort of trim that they created. This trim from the V&A is one of the most complex examples I've found of a puffed trim. They used both blue silk and a metallic cording to create those puffs. And then in between the puffs, they inserted different styles of knotted fringe and other embellishments. So you can see um, single fringes that have been grouped together and inserted. There's also fringes with those three pointed ends that are done in multiple shades of green or multiple shades of topaz that are included in the trim. It also includes these little parchment wrapped strips that have been folded into a flower shape. And all of that has been tied in as the puffs were created. I really like the puffed trims. I like the unusual look that they have and that softness from all that puffed silk. They also don't require the knowledge and the equipment of say weaving a trim, although it does help to be able to have a loom or something to tension your work around, but it's not necessary. You can actually just do it out of hand, which is really nice. So it's a little bit simpler and it's a little bit more unusual, which both make it a really fun thing in my book. Now the most common style of trim is some sort of woven braid. I would say that 60 to 70% of the examples I've looked at are some sort of braid. Now there's a lot of variation within those braids, but it is the most common um, structure that was used to create the final trim. This gown at the Met is trimmed with one of the simplest and most common styles of braids. So it matches the colors of the gown, which are kind of a blue green and a pale ivory color. And it uses both of those colors in the weave and in the picots that create the loops off to the side. And I love this example because you can zoom in so closely that you can almost count the number of threads that were used. And you can see that the blue and the ivory alternate in the braid and then the blue and the ivory alternate in the picots. This is a really common detail that you'll see in even more complex braids. Here's a slightly more complex example from the Met. It takes that same idea of a central braid and adds silk picots in between those larger picots along the side. This one also has fringes knotted into it and you'll see little bits of green as well as a couple shades of pink. Some of those fringes have knots at the ends and others look like they're more that X-shaped tufted fringe. So they worked in a few different elements here to create this trim. And again, the blue and white echo the stripes in the brocade, while the pinks and the greens echo the flowers, and the whole thing just comes together to perfectly accent the fabric that was chosen for this gown. This is one of the more complex braided examples, and it has that central braid with the little silk picots, as well as the larger pico made out of chenille yarn. And then it has those sort of rosebud styled coiled loops with fringes knotted into it at intervals. And again, you'll notice how those colors just really echo the color and the style of the gown. So if you're looking to create trim for your, so if you're looking to create your own trim, I would say that the chain stitch is probably the easiest technique to pick up and uses the least amount of equipment. The puffed trims are somewhere in between. I feel like I need 12 hands in order to create that trim, but I don't need a lot of extra tools. It's really just a whole bunch of shuttles and a lot of management of the threads. The more complex ones are the woven ones, and that requires you to buy a loom and learn how to weave. And that can be a little bit more daunting, but it also creates a really quick and easy trim once you get that learning curve under your belt. So if you're not really sure how much you want to invest in this, I would try one of the simpler methods first and then work your way up and see if either the puffed trims or the woven trims work for you. So while we were looking at those examples, I pointed out some picots, which are the little loops of either silk or heavier cord that run along one edge of the braid. And whether you're making a puffed trim or a woven braid, you can include these in your work for added texture and color. And there's a few different types of materials you can use that will change the texture of the trim based on what you choose. The most common option is probably this smooth silk wrapped gimp cord as seen in this example from the Met. There are also examples like this one from the V&A where that initial cord is wrapped with a second piece of cord to create a crinkled silk gimp um, that has a lot of texture to it. Another option is to use chenille thread, which is very fluffy and soft like a pipe cleaner, and that can be used to create those large picots as well. 
The final option is to create a very narrow braid and then use that as your picots. So this one has two gimp threads that alternate to create very tiny loops, and then that narrow braid is woven into a larger braid that also has silk picots. So this example from the Met actually has two different styles of picots. One are the very small tufts of ivory silk that are created along one side of the braid, and then over that is a heavier gimp thread that is creating arches over those smaller tufts. This is probably the most common arrangement, and there's a lot of room here for variations in color. Due to the way that these braids are woven, you don't really see the weft threads that pass back and forth, except where they come out on the sides as those picots. So it's possible to have one color for the center of the braid, another color for the picots, and then another color for the larger gimp picots that go over them. So at this point, you can see there's a lot of different ways to really create a lot of detail and interest in your finished trim. You can change up the colors, the texture of the materials, the types of fringes you're using, and the style of braid that you're creating. But that's not all. There's also a whole bunch of other embellishments that you can then work into those trims. So I call these trims bonbons because they remind me of little wrapped pieces of candy. What they are is pieces of a puffed trim that have been cut apart into short lengths that just have one or two puffs on each side. These are then included in a larger braid. There's another variation on that where, again, you're taking a puffed trim, but instead of the puffs being spread out, they're pushed very close together so they start to overlap. And then these little bits of trim are also cut apart and incorporated into a larger trim. This gown has loops of a gimp thread that are tied together along the center to create these little tufted loops that are incorporated into the trim. Another variation on that is this work bag at LACMA, where silk wrapped parchment is folded into loops and tied into the center before being incorporated into this tassel. That silk wrapped parchment can also be folded into loops that resemble a small flower or rosette, and that can be worked into gowns as well. There's this stomacher at LACMA where that folded parchment is created into flowers, which are then tacked onto the stomacher at intervals, and this gown from the V&A that we saw earlier where those folded flowers are incorporated into that puffed trim. Another really interesting and textural embellishment are these little rosettes. They're made from silk and wire that is coiled up to create these round shapes that look like little roses. These rosettes can be worked into a trim like this one at the V&A, or as we saw on that previous stomacher at LACMA, they're used on their own with a little tuft of green fringe that are sprinkled around the other flowers that are put on that stomacher. A variation on that has very similar flowers. They're made in the same fashion, but the loops have been cut so that the face of the flower resembles a soft velvety texture. Another variation is to take the same wired silk that's used on the rosettes, but instead form them into open petals. The center of those petals is then filled in with strands of silk, kind of like a spirograph going around and around to create an open pattern. This is a variation on another style of embellishment called Ganutel flowers. This example has some small flowers, which are a variation of Tenerife lace, in which there is a series of spokes of a heavier gimp that are wound around with a silk thread to resemble a small flower. This is then paired with knotted green silk fringe, which looks like leaves behind the flowers, and they're scattered across this stomacher. So one of the things I love the most about 18th century passementerie is that there is so much scope for individuality. You can choose different colors and textures, um, different styles of fringes, the different connections of different braids, and all the other embellishments that can be worked in, and you end up with something that is truly unique and all yours. Out of all the examples that I've looked at in museums where either I could zoom in on the website and see the detail of how they were constructed, or the small handful I've had the privilege of studying in person, no two are exactly alike. So, you know, that's kind of nice. If you're going to go through the time and labor and expense of making a trim like this, you kind of want something that really reflects your own personality and style and that no one else is going to have. And that's really what you get with all these different styles of passementerie. You can also see why I consider this to be so much more than fly fringe. Fringe is an amazing element of these trims, but there is so much else going on and there's so much variation that doesn't rely 
on the fringe itself to be the star of the show. I hope you've enjoyed this overview of 18th century Passamont Marie, and thank you for taking the time to watch this video. If you want more information or you want to actually learn the techniques of how to make all of these different styles of trim, they are included in my online class and the link is below. Um, I look forward to sharing more with you on this topic in the future, so if you have questions that you'd like to see answered, go ahead and put them in the comments and I'll either answer them there or put them in a future video. Thank you so much. Bye.